The Winds of Magic. Powerful forces that can be used to destroy your foes or aid your allies. Use your magic well and it might just win you a battle. Squander and waste it though and it might just cost you. In this guide, I'm not going to go through every single spell, although I will do that in a separate video, but I'm going to give you rather a way to look at magic to help you make sense of all the different spells, because there's over a hundred and that's a lot to learn and memorize, especially for a newer player. So we're going to look at how magic works, all the different spell types, how to use magic in general on the battlefield, and some of my favorite lore books and how I set them up and what spells I like to bring. So, let us begin. So, magic is wielded by any caster, lord, or hero, and it all relates to the bar in the bottom right corner, the winds of magic. This tells us everything we need to know in a battle, and it's made up of two parts, the power and the reserve. The power is kind of the magical ammo, the resource that you can spend on spells to be able to use them. If a spell costs 10 magic, it'll be deducted from this pool, so my 21 will turn into 11. The power reserve determines the recharge rate, how much magic I get back, because power is always recharging, always. As long as you've got one magic in your reserve, you will be regenerating some power. It'll take a hell of a long time at one reserve, but there'll still be something eventually. And the bigger this reserve number is, the faster your magic will recharge. The reserve goes down whenever you use a spell. So again, if you cast a spell that costs 10 magic, that 10 will also come off your power reserve as well as your power. So basically, the more magic you use, the slower it recharges. Which also means that because power is exclusively linked to time, the longer you can keep your power reserve high, the more magic you can recharge. Which may lead you to seeing combinations like this. Now, Alariel herself has a default of 60 power reserve, which is pretty much the same as every other caster in the game. But she can bring items and abilities to help her recharge. She has the Stave of Avalon, which greatly improves recharge rate, and the Arcane Conduit, which improves recharge rate and power reserves. And then you have the two mages. Both have the Starwood Staff, which increases power reserves, and the Book of Hoeth, which increases recharge rate. So with all that, you can understand that there's going to be a lot of magical recharge going on. And all those abilities pretty much do the same thing. They're all there to aid the recharge of your magic. So at the start of the battle, if you popped all the reserve buffing abilities, that is the Arcane Conduit and the two Starwood Staffs, you'll get a mighty 110 power reserves right at the start of the battle, which means you'll get a very quick recharge rate and you can throw off a bunch of spells nice and early and still get a good recharge rate on it. And that's without even using the recharge rate items and abilities yet. And when you do use those, that'll mean even more magic. And most of those abilities and items are reusable. So you just have to wait for the cooldown and then you can pop it again and again. Which obviously means an absolute scheiße ton of power at your disposal. You may also see the Double Toad Surprise. That is Lord Mazda Mundi and Lord Croak. Both bringing abilities that will give you a permanent 120 power reserve. Alariel and the Mage Trick is a temporary thing because it's abilities that will run out. But with these two that 120 is there for good. Until you use it up of course then it starts to go down but they'll allow you to keep a high recharge rate for longer, which means you'll be able to generate more power, which means more magic to use overall. You may also see Hatep on a Casket of Souls with five Casket of Souls with him, as a Casket of Souls gives a permanent 10 power reserve for each one. So if you've got six of them like here, that's an extra 60 power reserve, which again is 120 power reserve permanent. So just like the Double Toads, this will give you a lot of magic for longer. So that's how power and reserves work. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. It is quite confusing and there are some things that don't really add up and there are some kind of grey areas with magic. But for the most part, all you really need to know is that magical items and abilities that boost your recharge rate or your reserve are good. Bring them along, they'll give you more magic to play with. Also realise that the amount of magic you start with in a battle can have a big effect on how the battle plays out. If you start a battle with 3 power and 60 reserve, that could make things less intense at the start of a battle than if you started with 30 power and 60 reserve. But if you started with 30 and use it all up quickly, well that comes out of your reserve, so that means a slower recharge rate earlier in the battle. Things to think about. So then, on to the lore books and all the different magic that's available. There's 20 lore books, most of them with 6 spells in them, which means a hell of a lot to learn, right? 
Well, first of all, let's just make sure we understand the spell card and we know what everything means. So in a law book, you'll have all your different spells that do different things. And law books are generally geared towards kind of a certain playstyle. They'll be more offensive or defensive or supportive or all about damaging the enemy. But for spells themselves, you've got the spell type, you've got the spell duration, the spell range, what it can be cast on. Then you've got the magic cost up in the top left, the blue number. That's the important one to look at, how much the spell costs. Then you've also got the cooldown timer, which will tell you how long you have to wait before you can use the spell again. And sometimes you may see the amount of spell uses icon here as well. Then we have the overcast button, which will show you how much the spell will cost extra with an overcast and what the extra effects are. Wasn't too much of a difference on that spell, but with devolve, it nearly doubles the cost of the spell. So that's quite significant. The blue text will tell you the extra things that come with the overcast spell and also gives you the miscast chance of 50%. This means that there's a chance your caster might hurt themselves when casting the spell. So there's a bit of risk involved, and sometimes enemies can even come with an ability that will increase your miscast chance. So it'll put it up to 100% probably, meaning you're definitely going to take damage if you overcast spells. So something to watch out for. But how do we get to know all these spells then? Well, let's look at the different types first of all. Augment, Hex, Vortex, Wind, Magic, Missile, Explosion, Breath, Bombardment, Direct Damage, Regeneration. These are the 10 main types of magic spell. Sounds like a lot, right? But hey, we can group these up and realize that they're all actually kind of linked or similar. Let's start with Vortex, Wind, Explosion, Breath, and Bombardment. These are all basically the same spell. What the hell does that mean? Okay, here we go. So let's take the Law of Light here and the spell Banishment, a very popular spell from this law book. It's a vortex that lasts 18 seconds, causes magical damage, is a huge randomly moving AoE, which is good against armor. Cool, you've learned your first spell, you're welcome. Okay, now let's take a look at the Law of Heavens and Chain Lightning. A vortex spell lasts 21 seconds, magical damage, large randomly moving AoE, good against armor. Sound familiar? It's basically a banishment reskin. One lasts a little longer, one is a little bigger, but it's basically the same. Flamestorm, a vortex, 27 seconds, so a fair bit longer, causes magical damage and fire damage, a bit of a smaller randomly moving AoE, but it's basically the same as those other two vortex spells. The only big difference is that it's not so good against armor and should be aimed at light troops. Blade Wind, a vortex, 7 seconds, magical damage, large, randomly moving AoE, best used against light troops, but ultimately the same as those other three spells. You see, they're all so similar. There is a few little details that you got to look out for, like whether it's good against armor or whether it does fire damage. But ultimately, all of those are kind of the same. If you know how to use one vortex spell, you'll probably know how to use the rest. Although some can be fairly different, like the Pit of Shades here, it's a vortex, but it's stationary, so it doesn't move around. So be sure to check the tooltips to find the finer details that could help you choose the optimal use of the spell. Now take Penumbral Pendulum, a wind spell, only lasts a short while, causes magical damage, a forward moving AoE. Sounds kinda similar, right? Piercing Bolts of Burning, a bombardment, magical damage, fire damage, medium strike area, good against armor. Also again, sounds kinda familiar. Okay, well what about a breath spell, pestilent breath from the Skaven? It's a small spell that does magical damage, has a teardrop shape attack, which is ultimately an AoE, and isn't so good against armor. Sound familiar again? The difference between these five different spell types is just that they're different shapes. Bombardments, vortexes, and explosions are all just circles. Some of them are randomly moving if they're a vortex. All you gotta do is fill the circle with enemies and go for it. Breath spells, they're just triangles of different varieties and the spell moves in a certain direction. Again, just fill the triangle with enemies and go for it. What about wind spells? Those are just oblong rectangle type shapes. Just fill it with enemies and go for it. Of course, it moves in a certain direction. See, this is baby stuff. It's just shapes, man. If you know how to use one of these spells, you know how to use all of them, really. The main difference to look out for is whether they're good against armor or not. And these shape spells are best used against infantry or maybe cavalry. Like I said, just fill the box with enemies as much as you can, like I'm trying to do with this burning head here. Unfortunately, the slight randomness of the burning head has sent it away from the second unit, but you can see what I was going for. What about a bombardment that functions the same as a vortex that's stationary or an explosion? Just pop it down, fill it with enemies and go for it. The idea is ultimately the same with all of these. They just do damage in a small AoE. 
Some of them do it quickly, like an explosion, which happens in a few seconds, or it could be like a flamestorm, which goes on for 27 seconds. So hopefully that makes sense. All of those five different types of spells, Vortex, Wind, Explosion, Breath, Bombardment, all basically the same. Good for taking out infantry and maybe some cavalry. Okay, so how can we damage lords, heroes, single large monsters and monstrous infantry, if not with any of those shape damage spells? Well, that's where magic missiles can come in. Imagine those shape spell AoEs and all their damage being bundled up into a tiny little ball and then fired at an enemy. Whatever enemy that hits is going to take all that damage by itself. Which is why magic missiles are your go-to option for taking down lords, heroes, single large monsters and maybe some monstrous infantry. They do well at taking out single targets. Because those AoE shape spells spread their damage over a surface area and a lord or hero for example is only covering a small amount of that area, they do basically nothing. Two damage that did to Wolfric. These spells don't work against single entities. Which is why magic missiles are the best choice for taking down lords, heroes and single large monsters. They'll hit with a lot of damage just in a really small area. Some of the magic missiles function differently. Some of them are single projectiles that will be more explosive perhaps like a fireball. Some magic missiles will fire multiple projectiles, which means some of them might miss and some of them might hit. Obviously, it's best if all of them hit, you'll do more damage, but there's a bit of risk involved with magic missiles, of course. Sometimes they will completely miss and you'll do no damage. But to be honest, they are usually fairly accurate, but it's not a huge deal if they do miss because they're usually very cheap. Fireball, for example, only costs five wins of magic, five power. So it's not a great loss if it does miss. If you overcast it, of course, it's a bit more expensive, so then it is a bit more of a loss. But yeah, magic missiles generally best against single entities, but they can work against anything really. They're also a great choice for taking down flying units, especially if you're a faction that doesn't have great missiles to deal with flying units. So magic missiles, the best choice for taking down lords, heroes and single large monsters, but they can also work fairly well against infantry or cavalry as well, if you get the right angle. Now let's look at direct damage and regeneration. These two, again, basically the same thing, just kind of a switcheroo on them. So direct damage is basically just ripping health off of an enemy health bar. Simple as that. Takes away HP from a health bar. Some are designed for only single targets or are better against single combatants, whilst others are AoEs. And then you have the same thing but with healing. It's just the opposite effect. It brings the health bar back up. It raises the HP. It's designed obviously to be used on friendly units rather than enemy ones. Honestly, it's that simple. One brings the health bar up, one brings the health bar down. Direct damage spells do have a chance to be resisted though, so they might not do so much. It's a way for the spell to kind of miss. If you have an AoE direct damage spell like Flock of Doom here, you want to try and cram as many enemies as possible into that AoE. The more enemies you can hit, the more value you're going to get out of the spell. And the same thing with AoE healing, although some of those spells are capped at 4, so as long as you can get 4 units in there, you'll make the most of the AoE. If you cast an AoE heal like Earthblood and you only target 1 unit, you're not really getting much value for money there. It's a real waste. So try not to target single units with AoEs. If you can hit three or four units though, that's much better value for money. Hitting three units here is going to get me about a thousand points of healing on my units rather than just 300 on the single unit. So it's as simple as that for direct damage and regeneration. Not too much there. They just rip health off of health bars or add it back on. So then to the last two, Augment and Hex. These two, as you may have guessed, are very similar and relatable to each other. Augments are just buffs to your troops, improvements to their stats, namely. More melee defense, more melee attack, more armor, more speed, whatever it is, they make your unit stronger for a short period of time. This can help your unit win faster or turn around a losing fight, perhaps. Hexes do the opposite thing to the enemy. They are debuffs. They remove stats from the enemy. Like you can see here, minus 30 armor, minus 8 leadership. They take away the stats and lower them for a temporary time, which could allow you a chance to break the unit or just to do more damage to it or to stop them doing so much damage to you. They're that simple. Buffs and debuffs. And then also in the augment spell type, although it should probably have its own spell type, summons. Units that are spawned out of the ground from nowhere, anywhere on the map. These are a staple of undead factions, fantastic for harassing missile units or pinning cavalry and trapping it in place, or for just a simple and easy cheeky flank. And then in the hex category, you have net spells, which should probably have their own type as well. These can pin a unit or units in place and allow you to do what you'd like to them. Very often, focus firing the crap out of them or charging them when they can't charge you back are the good options. 
So that's pretty much all of the different types of spells that you're going to see. Hopefully this makes them a little bit more relatable to each other for you so you can understand them a little easier. There is a lot to learn though, there is no shortcut, there's no easy way to do it. But seeing the simple relations between the spells can certainly help, I think. So when it comes to using this magic on the battlefield, how should we actually do it? Well, it's all about supporting what is important to your army and dealing with the enemy threats. Important doesn't always necessarily mean the most expensive units, but sometimes it quite simply does. If you've got spearmen designed to hold a line, even if they're cheap, you'll want to heal them up to help them keep fighting. But sometimes just healing your strongest units can be the way to go because they can do more with the support or they can do more with the buff that you give them or they may take advantage more if you hurt the enemy that they're fighting with a magic missile. Honestly, there's a million different combinations of ways that you can use spells and buffs and everything else to support your troops. You can get pretty creative with it. Just use common sense so that the magic power isn't wasted. And if you want to damage the enemy army more than buff your own troops, you can either focus the more expensive units or take care of the ones that are going to give you a problem. We just dropped a penumbral pendulum on these chaos warriors. They're pretty expensive, so that's going to be some nice damage on them. And then there's these two Marauder Horse Masters. These aren't an incredibly strong unit, but they can be a bit of a problem for the Beastmen to deal with, a bit of a nuisance. This opportunity presented itself where they both clumped up together and dropping a nice pit of shades on them works a treat. And this is the next thing about magic. It's learning to see opportunities where magic could be really powerful and make a big difference. You need to be patient though. Sometimes these things can make a huge difference. When you get Colette caught up between Chaos Spawn and Minotaurs with great weapons which are anti-large and will do him a fair mischief, it's a good call to drop some armor reduction on him, an armor debuff to make him take more damage from them. That's just an opportunity that presented itself and against a strong target that I want to get rid of. So sometimes these good opportunities will just happen and you'll go for them, but other times you can kind of plan for them. For example, sometimes I like to bring armor reduction spells like Soul Blight or the Withering and use them on lords that end up in a bad situation. Because it's pretty much guaranteed a lord will go into a bad situation at least once or twice a battle and those are there to be taken advantage of. Or maybe I'm expecting to go up against some ethereal units. So I'll bring the Flaming Sword of Ruin from the Fire Law, which will give my unit most importantly magic damage, which is great against ethereal units. So anyone who fights that ethereal unit is going to get the Flaming Sword of Ruin to help them out. I pre-planned in my head how I want to use the spell and I'm just going to wait for that situation to happen and then drop the magic. So as I say, magic is mostly just common sense. It's hard to waste it unless you miss with a spell, but just make sure you're targeting units that are worth the investment. Peasant mob, for example, aren't a great investment for your magic. Grail knights, however, are. So if I have a spell like Harmonic Convergence here, which gives melee attack and melee defense, who's going to make better use of that? The peasant mob with their overall terrible stats anyway, or the grail knights who are already strong that could be made even stronger with Harmonic Convergence. Use it on the unit that's going to make the most of it. They'll be able to do more damage with that buff. Now for a few random miscellaneous tips. First of all, it's generally not a great idea to use those shape damage spells on moving units. Unless you feel like you can really get good at timing the spell for them to walk into it perfectly. Very often though, I see people attempt it when I watch them play on stream and it very often goes wrong and is a complete waste of resources. Like this comment here, landed in the middle of a bunch of troops but hey, they all mostly moved out the way and it did very little. If you have the patience, you can wait for a unit to be pinned in place fighting one of your other units. You do have to obviously be careful of friendly fire sometimes, but this will mean that the unit isn't going to dodge, they're not going to run out the way of it, you'll land bang on them and you should get a nice bit of damage. So have the patience to wait for those good opportunities for spells to be dropped rather than trying to rush them on the enemy as they're running up towards you. As you can see later on in this battle where we just missed with that Comet of Cassandra, now there's a big clump of enemy troops, there's some cold ones in there, there's some Dread Spears. This is a nice opportunity to absolutely drop a bomb right on their noggins. And it's going to do so much damage, it's going to eat some of my frames, and we're going to kill a whole bunch of Dread Spears, cold ones, it's going to do some nice work. All because we waited for the right opportunity to attack those pinned down units. The next piece of advice I can give you is not to worry about using all of your spells or even bringing them in the first place. If it's campaign you might get them over time and use them but really just focusing on one, two or three spells and getting to know them really well is not only a great way to learn but also makes it more manageable on the battlefield. Look at this with all six spells available. That's kind of a lot to look at in a hurry in the heat of a battle. You're not really going to be able to see all that and use it effectively, not to mention even have enough magic to use it all. 
Now look at this with only three spells. This looks much cleaner, a lot easier to manage. I've got a fireball, flaming sword of ruin and piercing bolts of burning. I've got the fireball if I want to snipe at any lords that may be around. I've got flaming sword of ruin to buff my troops damage up or to maybe help deal with ethereal units or anything with a physical resistance. And then I've got piercing bolts of burning which is great if there happens to be a clump of troops around. I can drop that on their heads and do a whole shicer ton again of damage. It's also useful to know the keyboard shortcut for selecting spells. If you hold alt and then press 1, 2, 3 or 4, 5, 6, you can select the spell in a clockwise direction. So 1 will do the fireball, 2 does the flaming sword and 3 does piercing bolts for me in this situation. If you can get into the habit of using those, it will improve your micro. Now to a couple of things for the total noobs to the series, as these very often go under the radar of newer players. Firstly, overcasting. I mentioned this earlier, this is when you click on a spell twice to get an upgraded version of it which will cost more magic and will do extra things. The other simple mechanic that newer players seem to miss is that you can turn spells, you don't have to do it in the direction it's facing. If you hold down the left mouse button you can rotate the spell to whatever direction you like and try to aim it perfectly. Do of course though be aware of friendly fire as you may hit your own units if you position it badly. Or if you just get unlucky with one of those randomly moving spells. Also, sometimes with AoE spells, you'll find that they kind of snap to a nearby unit, so as soon as you go near a unit, they'll try to select that unit. Maybe though you don't want this and you want more of a free movement. If you hold down Alt, you'll get exactly that. You can move it and it doesn't snap to units now, allowing you to get some better positioning and to get more units in the AoE. Whether it's a direct damage like Flock of Doom or a heal like Earthblood, it'll allow you to position it better by holding Alt. Now for the final things to think about before embarking on your magical journey. Cost efficiency and risk reward. The Wind of Death here, a powerful shape damage spell which can certainly hurt a lot of enemies, but it costs a whopping 20 magic. That's quite a lot, that's a third of your reserve in one go, and there's a chance it may miss. If the enemy sees it coming and moves out the way it could do very little. And for the price of that you could get three invocations of Nehek which heal your troops and is guaranteed to work. And of course if you overcast things that changes it again. What about Raise Dead? That only costs 4 magic, you could get 5 of those for the cost of 1 Wind of Death. Which is going to be more useful do you think? I think both can definitely be useful, but Wind of Death has a slimmer chance of having the right opportunity to make the most of it. It's high risk, high reward. Whereas cheap spells like Fireball here for only 5 magic, doesn't really matter too much if they miss. Or you could have something that's guaranteed to work, like Flaming Sword of Ruin. Or Vortex Spells. I don't really like randomly moving Vortex Spells. They're not for me. If they can miss, I don't really like it. Burning Head is a popular spell. Again, it can miss. Not a huge fan of it. So you have to think about how much cost efficiency there is in a spell. There's a lot of magic in that spell. Can you really make the use of it? Would you be better off using multiple of a cheaper spell? It's really personal preference though. Do you want to take those high risk, high reward chances? Or do you want to play it safe with some things that are guaranteed to work? Something like Final Transmutation is a very expensive spell and is one of the most expensive spells if you overcast it goes to 28 magic which is huge but it can do a hell of a lot of damage if you pull it off well. So you can take on that risk reward and if it comes off well it'll be pretty sweet. So it's entirely up to you how you want to play the game but just understand that there is risk and reward and some guaranteed effects of certain spells so it's really up to you how you want to roll. Allow me to show you how I like to roll with a few lore books that I often take out. So we'll do this on the Empire as they have a lot of different magical laws. So the Fire Wizard is a good go-to wizard for many situations. He's good against the undead factions because of a lot of their regeneration or the Wood Elves with all their wooden units. Also has the magical damage which is good against Wraiths. So I would get rid of Flamestorm, Burning Head and Cascading Cloak. I think I like the Fireball just as I set up earlier. Fireball good for sniping at laws or for blowing up infantry. Flaming Sword of Ruin, this one great for that magical damage like I mentioned earlier, good against the ethereal stuff. Piercing Bolts, good little AoE spell, good for groups of troops. A lot of people like Burning Head, I'm not a huge fan of it, it often misses or goes the wrong way. Can do a lot of damage if it goes off well, but a bit too much chance for me. I prefer magic that's more guaranteed to land, so it's less risk of wasting the magic. Same reason I don't take Flamestorm, it just goes all over the place. Might even take out your own troops and hurt you, so not worth the risk in my opinion. To the Lore of Shadows, another one I like. I probably set it up like so. I usually only bring about three spells. 
Pit of Shades, a good AoE damage spell, it's good against armor. It can be made even better though, if it's on an elite unit that's heavily armored, I'll very often overcast it, because while it is good against armor, it gets even better against armor if you overcast it. So if you get two or three bunched up heavily armored units, this can be a good move to overcast it, because it's worth the extra magic cost. So that's always a good one. I should mention actually that it's definitely worth checking out what the overcast of a spell does, because sometimes it can really change the properties of it. So while the Penumbral Pendulum isn't great against armor in its normal form, if you overcast it, it gains extra armor piercing damage. So it can kind of change the targeting a little bit. The Withering is a great spell, minus 30 armor, minus eight leadership, but it can only be cast on one unit. Unless you overcast it, then it turns into an AOE. So you could hit three or four units with it, which is very powerful. So if you can take all that armor off three or four units, you can do a lot of extra damage to those units. So definitely check out the overcasts of what your spells do because it could change the way you use it. So two strong damage spells there, the Pendulum and the Pit of Shades. The Withering, like I said earlier, I like these armor reduction spells. It also reduces leadership. Enfeebling Foe is nice too. Any melee defense debuff is always good. Sometimes I might bring Pendulum or I'll bring Enfeebling Foe instead. Depends on the faction that you're facing. Now onto one of the strongest law books in the game, the Law of Life, and all you need is this. Two spells. Regrowth, a healing spell that can heal one unit for a lot of health and give them 100% vigor, which is powerful in its own right. And then Earthblood, which is the AoE healing spell allowing you to heal multiple units. Both of those very strong spells, that's all you need. If you're new to the game and struggling to use magic, start with this, learn how to use the healing. It's really easy and really powerful. There are some other good spells in that lore book, but it takes away from the healing, so don't really bother with those. The Law of Light, I would probably set up like this. The Net of Amantok, this is great for pinning a unit in place, maybe a Lord or a single large monster, and then blasting the absolute crap out of it with all of your missiles. Sometimes, honestly, I'll only bring the Net of Amantok and just have that to keep using. Because it's got a short cooldown, it could be very powerful if used in the right situations. If you upgrade it as well, it becomes an AoE, so you can get multiple units netted. Shem's Burning Gaze, also nice magical missile, good against armor. Like I say, usually best using on the Lords. A lot of people like Banishment as a spell. Again, it's one of those random ones. It is very powerful if you get it to land right. High risk, high reward, blah, blah, blah. Not one I personally bring very often though. So there you go. A few law books and how I'd set them up. This is just my personal taste, my personal preference. Everyone's gonna be different. Nothing wrong with using any of the spells that I don't use, but it's good to experiment and try them out and see which ones you like. So there you go, a magical guide for a magical world of magic in Total War Warhammer. Hopefully you found this useful and it maybe simplifies the way you look at magic a little bit. I hope, perhaps, probably, maybe not. Let me know. Like I said, I'm going to do a video just going through all of the spells in all of the lore books, just talking about them briefly and if they're useful, if they're not useful, or what kind of situations they could be good or bad in, all that kind of stuff. So keep an eye out for that. Hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the future.